Welcome, everybody. For anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Arielle Gold, and I'm the Executive Director of the Fellowship of Reconciliation U.S. Chapter. And for anybody, we have a lot of folks on this Zoom already today. Um, for anybody who's not familiar with the Fellowship of Reconciliation, we are the oldest interfaith peace and justice organization um, in the U.S. And we do these monthly conversations uh, with faith leaders and peace and justice activists, educators, people we want to highlight and learn about their work and how they came to be who they are and to inspire us and um, give us that, that spunk to keep going, to keep working hard to create a better world, a world without hatred and racism, without war and violence. We're gonna be doing this month's Gathering Voices just a little bit differently. Usually I am the um, only host and I lead the, the conversation, but this month I'm really excited to have my colleague, I call him my, my right arm <laughs> as well, um, Bill McGarvey, who's an award-winning media professional. Um, if anyone who followed the campaign we led to have faith leaders call for a Christmas truce in Ukraine, Bill was instrumental in making that happen and worked around the clock uh, to see that that happened and to get it noticed in places like Religious News Service and the Washington Post. Um, he directed and produced a 30 minute documentary called Occupy at 10 and I encourage you to go to FOR's website. Someone can put that in the chat, a link to that. I encourage you to check it out. He's also a best-selling author and as you can see, a uh, musician, though he has not yet uh, entertained me um, with music. But Bill has become really close with Zohara and um, while well, I've been traveling, moving, actually. And I haven't gotten a chance yet to read Sahara's book. Bill has and has been, well, telling me about it frequently. So he's going to lead this conversation and I'm gonna help back him up and um, take questions uh, for him and Sahara. And with that, I give you Bill McGarvey. Uh, thanks a lot, Ariel. Thank you for that nice introduction. Uh, those of you who followed the Christmas truce, we appreciate all that support out there. Unfortunately, it didn't work. So we have to go get back to brass tacks and start working again. But uh, it was a wonderful experience. And it was a really beautiful moment for FOR and other folks, other groups, Code Pink, the National Council of Elders, to get together. So thank you so much for that. And, and to be honest, Zohara uh, Simmons, who is our guest today, and who's a friend of mine, uh, and uh, uh, it was actually instrumental in us getting that moving as well with the National Council of Elders and her many, many groups that she works with and individuals she works with. She's got enormous contacts down through her life. And that's really why I thought it would be great for us. And I mentioned this to Ariel a couple months ago uh, when 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 uh, Zohara mentioned there was a book being done. The book is called Stayed on Freedom. Hopefully you can see that. It's available everywhere. The Long History of Black Power Through One Family's Journey. It's by a professor named Dan Berger, who was actually a former student of Zohara's at the University of Florida. Zohara uh, uh, taught for 20 years, a tenured faculty member at the University of Florida in the religion department. Mm -hmm. But that's just one tiny part of this enormous journey she went on with Michael Simmons, who is her uh, now ex-husband. They've been uh, gone, for, uh, separated for many, many years, divorced for many years, and their daughter Aisha who's also a, a documentary filmmaker of some renown and is getting tons of fellowships, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, all throughout the, the through line through their lives has been this struggle of resistance and the struggle for black power. Uh, and I'll just give you a little bit of the history there before I introduce Zahara and bring her on and ask her to uh, read a little bit um, from, from her book. Uh, so Zahara was born Gwendolyn Robinson. I'm trying to share a screen here if I can. Sorry about that. Is there a share screen? Go ahead, Bill. Okay. I will. No, that's I, I, I have to share it. It's not a big deal. Oh, here you go. Share screen. 
Uh, so I'm just going to show you some pictures here. To Zahara uh, was uh, born Gwendolyn uh, Robinson in Memphis, Tennessee. She can talk a little bit about that. And she was raised essentially by this lovely woman we see here, Rhoda, who was her grandmother. And she was raised almost, almost exclusively by a grandmother till her mid to her teenage years. Her grandmother was also, uh, Rhoda was um, uh, raised herself by her own grandmother who was an enslaved person. Uh, so Zahara's trip takes her through in the early 60s, getting a full scholarship to Spelman College. And she will tell you more about this. But of course, back then it was, the idea was that uh, young black men and women go to these incredible uh, historically black colleges and universities to become upwardly mobile uh, members of society, et cetera. And fascinatingly uh, that she gets the book details in great detail about how when she gets to Spelman, the head of Spelman basically says, and the, the administration very, very sincerely says, your daughter at Spelman should not be involved in any of these activist things. We like Martin Luther King Jr., but that's not for us. We're not getting involved in the movement at all. Uh, so about two years in, along with the help of the people she's meeting along the way uh, through Mennonite House, which is Vincent Harding, uh, also through Howard Zinn, who was a very famously a professor who got let go from Spelman. She was influenced by the movement and eventually joined SNCC, uh, which very powerfully, uh, and she did a freedom summer in Mississippi and her grandmother and, and ultimately lost her scholarship to Spelman and her grandmother told her she essentially wouldn't speak to her anymore. Uh, so it's it, it, her journey from then goes through uh, SNCC and then the Black Power Movement from the Atlanta Project, uh, marrying Michael and moving to Philadelphia uh, eventually and joining the Nation of Islam for a while. Didn't really fit too well in there and I hope she talks a little about that because of her feminist uh, bent and her feminist sort of com uh, commitments. So did not fit too well into that and eventually found her her way into a, uh, a branch of Sufi Islam where they were given the name Zahara and that was mostly in Philadelphia. Uh, so this is her with her daughter Aisha was born in the late 60s and then on to uh, uh, Zahara uh, with Bawa who was their, their guru uh, in the Sufi Islam and then many, many moons after she had left Spelman eventually got her PhD from Temple University in religion. If I'm wrong on this, please let me know. And this is a more current contemporary picture of Zahara, Michael Simmons, and their daughter at some event. Um, so I just wanted to give people a little visual as they get to know Zahara here. And and Zahara, I think, has got a little bit prepared from her book, from the book, which is really essentially by Dan Berger, who's from countless hours of interviews with Zahara, Michael, and Aisha. So Zahara, please welcome to our gathering voices today. It's so good to be with you. And if you'd like, could you please maybe uh, read a little bit from your book? Say hello. I, I know you're not never at a loss for saying hello and greeting people. You're very welcoming. Individual. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you so much, Ariel and Bill and Ethan, who's operating some controls back there somewhere. Uh, my new colleagues who I uh love so much and am so thrilled to still be uh, on this in this struggle and meeting new friends who are committed to struggle as I am. And I must say that I scroll through some of the photos and I see that I have SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee colleagues uh, on. I have the American Friends Service Committee colleagues. Uh, I worked there for 23 years. Uh, and I have friends here from Gainesville, the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, where I am a member, uh, and possibly others whom I didn't see. My daughter is on, as is Michael. And so I just had to give them my fondest loving greetings. Um, Bill asked me to read something from the book and I, you've heard that I went to Laurel, Mississippi to be a part of the Mississippi Freedom Summer Project, which was in 1964. And Laurel was a town that had a, a huge Ku Klux Klan uh, 
involvement there and the people had been under threat as they were all over the state of Mississippi and in other places in the South where they could not register to vote, uh, certainly, you know, could not run for office. And, uh, you know, it was an apartheid situation. Uh, and so this is why SNCC decided to have a project that would bring in up to 1,000 volunteers uh, to crack open the state, as we said, to show to the world uh, what was going on in the state of Mississippi. And Laurel was where I was assigned to be the Freedom School coordinator. Uh, three days or so after we actually got into Laurel and got set up, uh, the person who was assigned to be the project director disappeared. Now you have to remember that we had already had Schwerner, Goodman and Cheney disappear. And everyone in the movement knew that they were dead, even though, you know, the people were claiming that they probably were down in Mexico having fun. I mean, they actually told those kinds of lies to the news reporters. So needless to say, when someone disappeared, you immediately thought the worst. And of course, calling the Atlanta office, calling the Jackson office, and they in turn calling the Justice Department, the FBI, you name it. Well, as it turned out, he had uh, and uh, we're having a little bit of technical difficulty. Are you still there? Maybe a little bit of a floating uh, Wi-Fi situation. Anyway, as I was saying uh, in Laurel, uh, when uh, Lester McKinney had to leave, then I became the project director. Uh, and of course, I was terrified and I knew nothing about being a project director, but somehow uh, the 23 volunteers, along with myself, we were able to mount a very successful Freedom Summer project there in Laurel and in Jones County beyond the city itself. And uh, so this is a little segment uh, from me talking about being in Laurel and the work that we were doing uh, let me just say that the work included freedom schools, creating freedom schools. We had two that operated uh, op, uh, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, organizing a chapter of it, and uh, certainly trying to get people registered to vote, but we knew that that was not going to happen. So we had what was called MOCK, M-O-C-K, uh, voter registration that took place in churches, in, uh, you know, in barbershops, beauty shops, anywhere we could set up. And so we were able to register the people ourselves, which was a part of a strategy to take all of these thousands of people we registered ourselves to the Democratic uh, Party convention held in Atlantic City. Uh, that August to show that the people in Mississippi, if given a chance, would register to vote. So uh, this is uh, a little segment from page 74. Through dependability, as much as courage, the Laurel Project earned the support of the community. The personal relationships Gwen and other project staff built, made SNCC's politics real. When a child fell out of a tree or a resident's wood stove caught fire in a poorly ventilated house, it was to the Laurel Project office that people ran. The town's fire trucks wouldn't be found on the black side of town. So Gwen and other Freedom Summer volunteers filled buckets full of water to douse the flames. 
Gwen felt this to be a spiritual success as well as a practical one. The freedom fight taught everyone, SNCC worker and Mississippi resident alike to reach beyond materialistic values of the movement's relationship to the locals, Gwen told a reporter, quote, we want to learn with them new values. This is a struggle for me to get away from this materialism. And while I'm struggling, I help them struggle. Not everyone in SNCC had such transcendent aims, she acknowledged, but the movement was giving her a glimpse of heaven on earth of a future without racism. This is religion to me, she said, end of quote. That's beautiful, thank you, Zahara. Oh, That's great. Beautiful. I, I love you, we talked earlier this week about this and, and I remember you said to me, I'd love you to give a little context around joining SNCC. That was 19, when you wrote that, when you said that, that quote, it was 1964, 65? Yes, 64. Yeah. So can you give us a little context? I mean, you, you said to me, he says, you know, I want to, you want to let people know that when you see the, you know, 75 years later, you see the end of the, or you see the story now, you think, oh, it was all fine, but how difficult it was. What was the context of your family and getting involved in SNCC and, and all that? You said it was not easy. Can you talk a little about that struggle? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> well, first of all, it's important for people to know that I came from a working class family. Uh, I was the first person in the immediate family to go to college. Uh, and my grandmother uh, who had finished the sixth grade uh, drummed into me ever since I can remember that I was going to college and that I was going to get an education. And so this was the trajectory that I had been set upon and I wanted it, you know. Uh, and of course, to my first college choice was Spelman College. Uh, it was the college that my minister's wife had graduated from. It was the college that my doctor's two daughters had graduated from, one of them being at Meharry Medical School when I left to go to Spelman and the other one being an opera singer uh, in Paris. Uh, so I knew that Spelman was the place that I needed to go because it, it produced results. And so of course my grandmother, my church, everybody on my street, my school, they were elated and wished me well. And so, when I got to Spelman, of course, the civil rights movement, the student movement was raging. Uh, and there were many students, not so many from Spelman at that point, but from Morehouse and Clark Atlanta. Well, it was just Clark University, the Atlanta University uh, and the other schools, uh, they had a movement going. And so they were always on campus attempting to recruit us. And as Bill noted, uh, my grandmother, when she and my mother and stepdad dropped me off, uh, they said, don't get involved. That's not what we brought you here for. So do not get involved. And my grandmother made me promise. And I promised her, I said, oh, no, 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 I'm not getting involved, I'm not. And I meant what I said to her. <laughs> And, uh, you know, obviously uh, fate had something else in store for me. Uh, first of all, uh, my grandmother also said, join a church as soon as you unpack your bags. And uh, so I met a friend who said, come and go with me to my church, my sister's church. And uh, so two Sundays or so in, off I went with her to her sister's church. Uh, and uh, it was the West Hunter Street Baptist Church, three blocks from Spelman's campus. And 
the minister of the church was Ralph David Abernathy. Well, that didn't mean anything to me. So I did not know who he was. Uh, but from day one, he was preaching about the movement. Uh, and then I learned that he had been uh, in Montgomery and very close to Dr. King in the Montgomery bus boycott and that he also was one of the founders of Dr. King's organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. So every Sunday from the pulpit, all I was hearing was everybody has to get involved in this movement. The other thing was that I just took a class from Stoughton Lynn, never knew who he was, uh, and got in the class, found out he was a Quaker and very involved in the movement. And it was American history as I had never had it taught before. So I learned about uh, you know, the slave revolts and reconstruction and all, I was in a state of shock because I didn't know about any of this. And so he was connecting the civil rights movement to the abolitionist struggle, to the reconstruction struggles. And it was sort of like, oh my God, is really? And then, uh, you know, the SNCC people were always on campus. One in particular was Willie Ricks. And all my SNCC friends know who he is. We now know him as Mukasa. And he was like, sister, you better get on, on board here. And I was like, no, that's not what I came here for. Well, he was on campus practically every day wearing me and others down. So, you know, it was getting to be very difficult not to be involved. And as you mentioned, uh, I met Benson and Rose Harding. Uh, they were head of Mennonite House. And uh, someone told me, because at Spelman, you didn't get a hot meal on Sundays in the evening. And we were always hungry. Some people had money, you know, to go to restaurants for their evening meal. And I didn't have that. And somebody said, have you heard of Mennonite House? They said, they have a big dinner every Sunday. Uh, and it's free. And I was like, how do you get there? <laughs> so uh, off I went to the Mennonite house and met Rose and Vincent. And of course it was love uh, almost immediately. And I started going regularly and there were always discussions. And it was the first time that I had ever met white young people my age because there were students from Emory uh, from Georgia Tech. And here we were all sitting around these tables eating together and treating each other like human beings. This was a first, you know, other than Stoughton and I later met Howard um, and I had some other white teachers, but this, this was all first because this had not been the case growing up in the apartheid system. Uh, lest we forget, that's exactly what it was. It was apartheid. It dawns on me, Zara, when you're saying this, I'm sorry, when you're saying this, it dawns on me that you actually took your grandmother's advice to heart and did find oh, a yeah. church. You, oh, you found yeah. a church and then found Reverend Abernathy, which actually in some ways maybe set you on that course to where you ended up, right? Well, yes. And then, you know, maybe three Sundays in, there was Martin Luther King sitting up in the pulpit. Well, I knew who he was because I knew about the boycott. And of course he was singing the same song as of Abernathy uh, and saying what marches were gonna be happening that he was leading and how we all needed to join. So I was being worn down. I mean, it was like, I felt ashamed really uh, not to be joining the SNCC young people, all of whom were my age, had dropped out of college to work full time. And so little by little, and I'm sorry to drag this out, but I started getting involved and trying to keep it a secret. Clearly, the, first of all, uh, Spellman did not want us involved and told us that if, we, if they found out that we were involved, we could lose our scholarships. Well, of course, that meant I would be sent home because nobody could afford to keep me there. 
Uh, and uh, so little by little, uh, first I went to the SNCC office uh, and you know you had to lie on the sheet that you signed out for because you clearly could not say you were going to SNCC. Uh, so I probably said I was going to the library or to visit a friend in a dorm. Uh, and anyway, I would go to the SNCC office. Uh, you know, Jim Foreman is there sweeping the floor. And I'm like, who is he, you know? And I meet John Lewis, who is he, you know? And all of these people, and they just welcome me. And, and um, it was, uh, you know, they were beginning to break down uh, all the promises I had made to my grandmother but I was still trying to hang on. Now, moving ahead, I got involved with the student organization. Uh, somehow I got through that first year without getting in big trouble, uh, even though I had gone on a few demonstrations. But the second year I was elected to be uh, in, uh, what was it called? The uh, uh, Student Appeal for Human Rights. This was an organization founded by Julian Bond and other students. And I was elected to be a representative to SNCC from that organization. Well, the minute that I let my name be put in and I got elected, I knew everything was going to change. And then I started going to the SNCC meetings, again, lying about where I was going having people cover for me in the dorm to protect me from the house mother. Some of, one of those people protecting me was Alice Walker who lived right across the hall and was the RA. So, you know, she could cover for me pretty well. Uh, but anyway, I learned that there was gonna be a Mississippi Freedom Summer Project. And of course, Howard Zinn was uh, an advisor to SNCC. He was very involved. Stoughton Lynn uh, was uh, going to, was helping to develop the curriculum for the Freedom Schools. Uh, I got involved with him as a student working on uh, independent study to work with him on developing the uh, curriculum. Anyway, you know, things had changed drastically. I knew that I had to go to Mississippi. And I also knew that my grandmother would never ever permitted if she could have her way. And of course, I had been taught all my life about how horrible Mississippi was. It was the worst place in the world. Uh, people would run from the plantations in the dead of night uh, and people would hide them out in Memphis and help them get on a freight train going north. I mean, I knew all these stories. So to tell her I was going to Mississippi to help people, black people <laughs> register to vote, mm -hmm. to her that was like saying, I'm getting ready to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was no way she was going for it. And so my idea that I had plotted out with the SNCC folk and with Thornton Lynn and others that I wasn't telling her. I just wasn't gonna go home at the end of the spring semester of 1964. But, you know, a number of my friends knew somehow it got back to the dean. The dean called my grandmother and told her what I had planned. And so on the day after the last classes, uh, Mrs. Gordon, who was our house mother, who lived in the dorm with us, knocked on my door at six in the morning saying, you have guests. And I'm like, we don't have guests at 6 a.m. in the morning. That's, what are you talking about, Miss Gordon? And then my grandmother said, it's me. And I've come to take you home. I was like, oh my God. Well, she, she knew, she knew, right? She had, she had been told. Well, the somebody... dean had called her and told her. Right. The dean right. of Spelman called her and told her what I was planning. That's where they kind of took you back to Memphis and they kind of, as you call, talk about in the book, they kind of held you hostage for a few days. Was yeah, they did. And yeah. I was Sorry. trying to get word. Well, I'd left a few notes to let Stoughton know what had happened. And of course I was getting in touch by phone, collect calls to SNCC, letting Jim Foreman know what had happened. And of course, Jim Foreman sent me the money 
for a bus ticket and my grandmother intercepted it, tore it up and bragged about it to me. And so then I had to call Jim Foreman back and say, don't put it in my name and don't send it to my house. I gave him a name and a place to send it. So he sent the uh, money order to my girlfriend who then bought my ticket. So and uh, it's extraordinary how much, I mean, it was, it was a huge rupture in your family, it sounds yeah. like. So what, what oh, was it, I mean, so SNCC must have been, it was, you, they talk about in the book how it, it must have been an overwhelming sort of feeling going on at SNCC that you, that you were being a part of to go through all that in order to be a part of it. It sounds like whatever was happening at that offices and with those people was just very heady and very important uh, in order for you to just change your path so much, right? Oh, absolutely. So now remember, it's, it's Benson and Rose because Benson is very involved in the planning of mm -hmm. the 1964 Mississippi Summer Project. Stoughton is involved, Howard Zinn is involved. Uh, I mean, you know, it's, these are the people who have become my mentors, my friends, uh, and I'm learning all this history and I'm understanding how the civil rights movement is a continuation of the long struggle that African-Americans have been engaged in uh, as Benson Harding says in his book, There is a River that began in Africa when people fought against being enslaved. Mm -hmm. So this, this his history had become alive to me. And I understood that what we were doing was a continuation of something that had begun in 1619. It was too important not to be a part of it, but it was also very difficult because to have my grandmother tell me, if you leave, don't ever come back. Uh, and for my mother to be standing there and my dad backing her up, uh, that was heartbreaking. And also to leave Spelman. Now, of course, I didn't realize I was leaving forever, uh, at least leaving college, because with Stoughton's help, I had already been uh, without my parents' knowledge, admitted to Antioch. And he got uh, Coretta Scott King to help me get into Antioch because he told me, you're never going to survive at Spelman. They don't want you here. You need to leave. And then he, I said, well, leave and go where? You know, and he said Antioch. And I'd never heard of Antioch. So then he, you know, made arrangements for Mrs. King, who had gone to Antioch to help me. So I had already been admitted to Antioch when I left for Mississippi. But just uh, and that's where I thought I was going. To fast forward, you go to Laurel, and in those two years in SNCC, it sounds like you eventually get to the Atlanta. It sounds like that's where the ideas around Black Power really started to 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 sort of take form with you and other members of SNCC in the Atlanta project, right? It's sort of things you started sort of moving away from SNCC, is that fair to say? Can you talk a little bit about that? No, it wasn't moving away from SNCC. It was a natural development uh, of understanding uh, that African-Americans needed to have a sense of the movement being their movement. Uh, and it's important because this is a very delicate issue and it, it practically tore SNCC apart uh, because many of us understood that because of internalized racism, uh, the fact that black people had been indoctrinated inculcated in the knowledge, in the belief uh, of inferiority. I mean, let's just be, out front about it. Many people had that feeling. So I experienced in Laurel uh, that when a Black person came into the office, we called it the COFO office then, uh, if there was a white person there, they assumed that person was in charge. And so I could be there uh, and it might even <laughs> have a, something on the desk that said I was in charge. It didn't matter because if white people were on the premises, they were in charge because this is how they had grown up. 
So of course I had seen this uh, uh, and many times had had sort of internal workshops with the volunteers about this, that they needed to work at helping black people not feel inferior to them, uh, not think that they were the ones in charge uh, because this was a black movement and it was so important. So what happened in the Atlanta project of SNCC was that many of us sat around and shared with a tape recorder going what our experiences had been and how it was important for SNCC to be seen as a black organization and that racism could not be solved in the black community, that it had to be solved in the white community. And so we wanted our white colleagues and comrades to go into the white community to organize, to educate, just as we were doing in the black community so that we could bring the two groups together to really create uh, the democratic society that we wanted. But of course this, uh, you know, the fact that when Stokely said black power on that march in Mississippi, uh, the media, you know, took it to be a, a statement of hate. Uh, and then the whole issue of the role of whites in SNCC, uh, this was very, very difficult because many of the white colleagues had also left their families and, and been kicked out of their homes to become part of this movement. And so there was a lot of hurt uh, that I wish we could have handled it differently. But mm -hmm. the whole issue had to do with uh, black people taking ownership and being seen as self-determining uh, leaders of their own community and for our white comrades to go into the white community and educate uh, them about the problems of racism and the anti-democratic nature of our society. That's great. I, I, I want to bring Ariel in here a second. Yeah. I, get, I want to get to the religious aspect, the nation of Islam, and then moving on. But yeah, Ariel, please jump in with. And I, then I just want to jump questions. in for a minute and bring us up to today, and this this question about what is the role of white people, and especially in this moment uh, where Christian national, white Christian nationalism, uh, is is soaring uh, in prominence and. How would you see that evolution to today, um, the role of, of white people and specifically white Christian Americans um, in educating our own communities? Well, uh, you know, let me just back up a minute to say that there were a number of white SNCC uh, organizers who did go into the white community to organize and there were, there were projects and they found it was very difficult. And in some cases, when the community, the white community learned that they were connected to the civil rights movement, their lives were threatened and they were run out of these towns. So uh, as I look back and as I'm very active still to this day, I think that there should have been more effort. Uh, and of course it was dangerous. Uh, whereas in the black community, you know, we were welcomed, we were given homes and all of this. This was not the case for our white comrades who went into the white community to organize. So, uh, but nonetheless, we can see today that we still have the same problems uh, I mean, even though the civil rights movement uh, made a major change, particularly in the South, uh, you know, no question about it, uh, but that uh, deep-seated uh, white supremacy uh, and racism was not, uh, unfortunately, uh, unearthed. And so when you have uh, movements like Trump has led it's easy to ignite it again, uh, particularly when people uh, feel that they are 
losing out on the America that they thought they were going to have. Uh, and so you need to blame somebody. So then you can blame black and brown people, you can blame immigrants. And then if you bring in uh, white nationalist Christianity to buttress uh, this white supremacy, uh, you really got problems. And that's exactly what we have now. So this is, and when I look at, you know, I'm in Florida, uh, the red state with uh, DeSantis, who's a very dangerous person, uh, you know, leading the fight against the teaching of true American history, Black history, being anti, uh, you know, uh, anything that tells the truth about this country and the movements that have brought us forward. Uh, and people are eating this stuff up and it's not just in the South. So we do have tremendous problems to deal with. That's, thank you. And I want to encourage folks in the chat to please add some questions as well, if they have any. Sorry, Errol, did you have any, um, did that answer your question? I, I that was a. That absolutely did. I just seem so relevant to today. And, uh, and I also want to hear about faith. And so please, Bill, continue. Oh, yeah. I mean, Zohar, when I, when I told her that our, that, that our next, and thank you for the questions are coming. And we hope, by the way, before we get off, before we, before we have Zohar lead us in prayer, before we're done, we're going to have Michael and Aisha hopefully to get on with us and say hello at the end. So please stay tuned for that as well. And we've got a lot of people here. So thank you for being here. But I, but, but Zara, we talked a lot about um, the role of faith. You joined the Nation of Islam for a little while, never really fully, sounds like you were particularly enmeshed in that world as much with Farrakhan. And, and then, and then, uh, like somebody's uh, anyway, but Okay. And then, and then kind of get into the, you're, you're a sort of a Sufi Islam, but you've always talked about the importance of, of faith in your own journey on this. And you also talk about that nobody so far in all the public publicity you're doing in the book talks about religion and faith. Can you speak to that a little bit and the importance of it? Certainly. Uh, and, and let me just remind people who don't know um, uh, that I was raised in a deeply religious home uh, and my grandmother and grandfather and all of my family uh, were, you know, avid churchgoers. And so uh, religion was a, a foundational piece for me. Uh, then when I joined the civil rights movement, uh, you will recall that the uh, Jim Lawson, who was there at the founding of SNCC, uh, and then you have, you know, many people who were deeply religious, who were in the civil rights movement, not only Dr. King's movement, but in SNCC itself. Uh, and so when I joined the movement, while I was not nearly as religious uh, as I had been growing up, it was important to me that religion was a major component of our movement. And of course, living and working in Mississippi with the people like Mrs. Eberta Spinks and Miss Carrie Clayton and others, these were deeply religious people. And they were putting everything on the line to uh, join this movement, to have us living in their homes. Their, uh, you know, These are homes they had worked for all their lives. And they were putting all of that on the line. And what enabled them to do it was their deep faith in God. And so this, of course, while I might have been, you know, trying to move away from that, this was constantly being reinforced by all these women, Fannie Lou Hamer. I mean, you know, there's so many others. They were all very deeply religious people. Uh, and then, of course, when I um, began learning more about uh, black nationalism, et cetera. When we were in Atlanta, uh, there was a Nation of Islam uh, mosque, they were called temples then, that was right close by where the Atlanta Project office was. 
And so these uh, uh, men particularly were always coming by the office, dropping off the newspaper, talking to us about Islam. At that point, I was much more interested in the social programming of the nation, the whole idea that uh, Black people needed a homeland. And in his, what he was proposing was five states uh, where Black people could live uh, in peace and harmony amongst themselves. And while I think in retrospect, he never expected that to happen, they were building institutions right wherever there were these temples. So there were businesses. And remember growing up in the Jim Crow South, I had always seen black businesses because, because of apartheid, we had to have our own everything. So, you know, that included uh, pharmacies, doctors, uh, dentists, uh, you know, little grocery stores, shoe shops, uh, cleaners. So, of course, when I saw that the nation was promoting that Black people own their own businesses and have them on a much larger scale and of course buying farmland and all of that. That's what really attracted me much more so than the religion itself. Uh, but of course, once I got involved, then I wanted to know more about, well, wait a minute. So you're Islamic, so, you know, what is it, you know? And I began studying beyond just what the nation of Islam itself uh, was teaching. And there were many within the nation who were deeply committed to Islam as a religious practice, but that was not what initially attracted me to it. But of course, uh, I was always interested in the spiritual aspects of life. And while in SNCC, I had been introduced to uh, uh, Sufism, but before Sufism even, uh, other forms of mysticism. And so this really attracted me and it began my uh, digging into uh, aspects of mysticism, both in Christianity and in Islam. And of course, this led me to meet uh, a teacher who had come from Sri Lanka to the United States uh, named M.R. Bawa Mahayuddin. And of course, prior to meeting him, I had read the collected works of uh, Inayat Khan, Hazrat Inayat Khan. Mm -hmm. I'd read some other Sufi works and mm -hmm. these appealed deeply to me. Mm -hmm. And so that began my sort of formal and informal search in the mystical stream. Uh, certainly working for the Quakers, uh, that also that mystical stream of Christianity that the Quakers represent also was quite influential in my life. That's interesting. I, I really, this is so good. And we, I know we we'll probably go a little bit over time if folks are okay. We've got great numbers of people and, and people are putting tons of questions in here, but one that it's kind of, I apologize if we can't get all to the all to all the questions, but the question of gendered uh, violence or gender. Yeah. In the, go ahead, Ariel. Sorry. I wonder, first of all, if I can add to this question a little bit, but also I, I just want to propose here as um, as we're we're already close to an hour in and we've got full house and a lot of questions and engagement. So I'm thinking that we likely want to do a follow-up, whether that's next month or a couple months down the road and have you back. And so that we can really go from um, your, your history and what, what brought you here to your thoughts on today as well. We, we touched on that, but I think we could go a lot deeper. So um, I just want to propose that as an idea. And, and, and I want you to know I'm, I'm <laughs> able to go on for some more time, unless right. you guys are not. I feel going longer, but I still think we're going to want to do a part two at some point and, and really on. dig into, you know, um, the work you've done with us uh, to end the war in Ukraine and, and so much more. But on this question of, of gender 
and movement. And um, I know you get real personal in, in your book. And I appreciate that because I'm, I'm one who believes that the personal is political. And I think there's so many of us, my, myself included, who are survivors of sexual assault. I mean, and, and including within the movement. So I wonder if you could talk about uh, gender within the movement, feminism within the movement, and then also broadly in, in your life and um, what it is which includes to, to be a single mother, a working single mother in the movement, which is also something I've, I've that's personal to, to my heart and, and just so many of us. But if you could speak a bit about women. Uh, certainly. The, uh, you know, SNCC, uh, was, from what I know of it, the most egalitarian gender-wise of the civil rights movements. And everybody's got to remember, we're talking the 1950s and 60s. And uh, this is a patriarchal society. It's a sexist society. It always has been. And so there's no way, unless you are working at uh, uh, digging out the roots of patriarchy and uh, in some cases misogyny, you know, hatred of women, uh, it's not going to happen. So certainly while SNCC was a lot more egalitarian than others, sexism absolutely was within the organization. Uh, sometimes my colleagues remind me that women in SNCC were heads of uh, you know offices. We were project directors, et cetera. That's true. But nonetheless, there was still sexism. I certainly know that I felt in Laurel as a project director that I was the last one to get a number of things like a brand new car. Uh, when the cars were being given out, you know, they were given to the men first, even though for a time after the summer project, there were just three women in Laurel and we had these old clunkers and, you know, trying to outrun the clan and them was uh, not something you could really uh, do. So, you know, I had to fight to get a car, a fast uh, new car. Uh, then there was, you know, I was sexually assaulted uh, while I was in SNCC. Uh, and, uh, this happened to others and I know others to whom it happened and it certainly happened to me uh, by someone whom I respected and uh, you know was just stunned uh, that he would do this to me because here I am a comrade you know as we used to say putting my life on the line just as he was that he would dare to sexually assault me uh, but this, you know, this is the complexity of, uh, of life in these societies. And as you all know, I spent uh, two years living in the Middle East doing my dissertation research uh, on the impact of Sharia law on women uh, in Jordan, that's the title of the dissertation. And of course I traveled uh, back and forth to S Syria and Egypt and Palestine and Israel, interviewing women uh, about this issue. And so, and working to help women who were already trying to change the laws and the interpretations of the Hadith uh, that undergird these very sexist, misogynist laws that were on the books in all of these societies. Uh, and certainly I witnessed uh, the terrible, terrible treatment of women in many of these societies. And uh, so this is, you know, something that is very deep uh, in my own heart uh, to work on uh, issues about uh, women and law and women and culture and women and religion, because often the religions sanctify the 
uh, mistreatment of women. And uh, this is a huge problem in all of the Abrahamic faiths. It's not just Islam. It's in Judaism and it is in uh, Christianity. And I have been working on that for many years now with uh, daughters of Abraham, as we often call ourselves, uh, trying to change the way women are treated uh, that has been buttressed by our religious traditions. We have so many great comments here. Yeah. Yeah, patriarchy is deep. And thank you for that multiple level work within the movement and to transform the movement and within to honor faith and yet transform the problematic elements. Bill, please go ahead. No, but thank you. Uh, we're going to probably go 15 or 20 minutes over to 515 or so. So thank you for your patience. So many great quotes. Somebody just, I think it was, I can't remember who, but I think it was, uh, somebody just said, yes, we should do a series just on this topic of gender. Uh, and perhaps that is a good example. I mean, there's a lot of energy around that. I apologize that I can't get to all these. Is there, have you, have you, you've been paying more attention to the questions perhaps? Can you, have you anything in there, Ariel, you'd like to highlight? Yeah. Um, uh, hold on. A lot of, a lot of questions in here on, on big questions on reparations. Uh, your work with AFC, with the Quakers, and I think Ethan highlighted a question there that it was about um, uh, your work on police brutality and surveillance state, red squads way back in the 1970s. I wasn't aware of that. That's not really in the book too much. Somebody asked about that. In the, uh, I think it was uh, Linda Lotz asked about that. Can you talk about that? A little and bit? Lin uh, hi, Linda. Thank you for that. Linda and I worked in the AFSC together. Uh, yes, when I was hired uh, to work at the AFSC, it was as the associate director of the program on government surveillance and citizens' rights. What a long name. Uh, <laughs> but this was a national project to investigate the role of red squads, which are police, local police intelligence units uh, that worked closely with the FBI and others spying on civil rights, human rights, peace organizations, infiltrating those organizations uh, and often being agent provocateurs uh, to get people to do things that they knew would break the law so that they could be arrested. Um, just to tell you something that, you know, really was so shocking. I went to uh, as a part of my work, I traveled all over the country interviewing people uh, who had been in the movements. And that included not only, you know, the civil rights movement, uh, but the uh, American Indian movement, the Brown Berets as the Mexican American uh, movement was called, uh, the Black Panthers, et cetera. And so I went to Chicago and uh, at that point, the place, uh, where, and you know, the name just ran out of my head that quickly, uh, Ham um, Hampton, somebody help me, was killed by the police. Uh, he was a Black Panther leader. They made a movie about it. Bobby uh, Hampton. Fred. Fred Hampton. Fred Hampton. Hampton. Thank, Thank you. you. Somebody put it in the chat. Thank you for helping me. So, of course, I interviewed Fred Hampton's girlfriend who was inside the apartment when the FBI and the uh, Red Squad uh, did the shootout, uh, uh, it wasn't a shootout, it was a shoot in that killed him uh, and another Panther member. You may know any of you who saw the film that she escaped without being killed. And so they took me to the apartment to show me the bullet holes that there was none from coming out from the apartment, they were all going in. Uh, certainly interviewing a lot of people out on the West Coast uh, about Panthers uh, who were killed, who were set up. Uh, this was a mind blowing assignment. And one of the things we did was to prepare uh, reports that we sent to the Congress uh, about the illegal activities. Uh, shockingly, uh, the Quaker 
meeting houses were infiltrated. Uh, and in one case, a FBI agent became the head of the meeting. Uh, so, you know, there was no respect for anything because the Quakers were seen as, you know, in the forefront of the peace movement. So they too had to be uh, spied upon, uh, et cetera. So this was uh, my first job with the American Friends Service Committee. And of course, uh, we also uh, started looking at police violence, uh, but the main focus was on these intelligence units and how they had been used to destroy our social change movements of that era. Great. I have a, we have a question here um, that uh, Ethan brought up about talking about intergenerational um, uh, issues, and 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 Ethan mentions uh, your your role as a mentor with today's frontline organizers, dream defenders, et cetera. Do you want to talk about like what you're seeing yeah, among them? And I want to add to that just a little bit because it relates to mentorship. What keeps you going? You've been in this for a long time, like you said. White Christian nationalism and white supremacy is as strong and flourishing as ever. So what keeps you going and how uh, intergenerational work may play into that? Well, certainly, uh, I'm glad you connected the two. Uh, uh, Michael Simmons, uh, who I think is still on the call, the biography is about him and me. Uh, he was asked this question at a session in, uh, I believe it was in DC. Uh, and he said, well, you know, what you gonna do? I mean, you see what's going on. How can, how can you not do whatever it is you can do? Um, now maybe, and I, I feel the same way. I mean, I would like to turn away, but I can't. I mean, um, you know, it's the situation is such that you care about the young people, you care about the old people, you care about everybody. Uh, and to be able to change uh, the bad things, uh, to put it just briefly, that are happening in our society, uh, it seems to me like a duty uh, to do whatever you can. And certainly working with young people in the Dream Defenders and the Black Lives Matter movement and initially in the Occupy movement uh, where you know I was sitting out there with the Occupy people in Oakland, in New York, and even here in Gainesville, Florida, where I live. And I was moved and impressed uh, with just being with them and certainly Many of the people who founded the Dream Defenders had been students of mine here at the University of Florida. And when Trayvon Martin was killed, these people who had been sitting in my classes, I didn't even know if they were really being moved by all the stuff we were talking about and all the films, you know, and stuff. And then when Trayvon was killed, these people just jumped up. They were like, we're going to do something about this. So I was like, oh, my goodness. Yes, yes. And, uh, you know, the Dream Defenders was born uh, from that. So that certainly being with them does give me hope. And it also uh, enlivens my spirit uh, to know that there is another generation and another generation after that uh, coming uh, on who are going to fight for what is right, what is good, and still try to make this society the society it has never been uh, to, live, to live up to its founding documents. So we have brought Michael Simmons on since you mentioned him and since so much of the book is about him. So if we could just uh, say a brief hello to you, Michael. And Is Michael, yeah, uh, is he on here? Yes, and Bill, maybe if you have a, a question for Michael as well. Uh, well, Michael, what was, I mean, it was, 
spotlight him or do yeah, something? Yeah, why would we spotlight him? Can you? Oh, he, he is. He is on, on video for other folks. He is. Okay, and I don't think Aisha is still here, but uh, she might not be because I look for her. But yeah, Michael, it's, it's nice to meet you this way. Uh, I, it's it, What was it, um, the process of putting this book together and reading it back, is, is it, uh, what is that like looking back at 70 or, or 60 years of activism? Oh, well, it's been amazing. I mean, you know, you, it, 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 when you look back on it, it feels like yesterday in many ways, but, uh, but, it, but like, I'm just um, so in a very humble way, proud of the things I've been um, able to do, people I've met and, um, and a few of the changes that I helped to make. Yeah. Well, it sounds like, given the fact that you and Zahara split up relatively early after Aisha, not you know, when Aisha was pretty young, you talk about how movements have difficulty staying together, and yet you, you and Zahara have been, you know, sort of compatriots in many other ways. How was that? I mean, given all the struggles and movements, how how did you do that in your personal relationship? And maybe I should, maybe Zahara should say this, speak to that. Well. Well, let me just say, very quick, I mean, that because we always respected each other, one, mm -hmm. um, our relationship um, was um, uh, one of um, love and friendship and uh, and our goals in a broad sense, while we may have had got different strategies, even got different philosophies along the way, we both understood that our work was rooted in the love of the people with whom we were working. Yeah. Which goes beyond African Americans, I might add. Yeah. And it's it's pretty clear in the book toward the end, and maybe Zara, you can comment on this. Dan Berger, who apparently is going to be doing an event on February twenty fourth, that I think we put in the uh, you put in the the chat there. Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah. So, but Dan mentioned it really sounds like at a certain point with your daughter and and Zahara, clearly the three of you really focused on feminism, the role of women. And I know you've been very outspoken. Uh, Zahara is talking. You talk a little bit about that, Zahara, about how Michael has sort of supported you in that, those conversations. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Michael has has been uh, what I would call a feminist uh, pretty much ever since I've known him, uh, and therefore, you know, his work uh, within uh, our organizations, he has always supported uh, women. And, you know, Michael also worked for the American Friends Service Committee. So we were working there together in the Third World Coalition within uh, the AFSC. Uh, Michael was a supporter of the women's movement. I mean, the uh, women's program within AFSC. Uh, so, you know, this has uh, been a collaboration uh, for 60 years uh, on many issues that we both feel so strongly about. But so let me just say on, on that issue though of sexism, I mean, philosophically, clearly I'm, you know, what Zahara says is true, but that doesn't mean that like I haven't come a long ways okay. since the 60s. I mean, I, um, <laughs> I can remember one particular time when when even though I disagreed with it, I acquiesced to um, some men that and women that Zahara and I were around. And when the men got to talking politics, the women were kind of ushered out of the room. And while I thought, particularly with Zahara, that it was absurd, I didn't take a, a, a stand against it. And, and so that's just but one thing that sticks out of my mind. And, but the, the point I want to make, though, is that is that one, the struggle against sexism has to be uh, men talking to men, and not men being quote allies of women, as if that that in of itself is cool because you you know which side to vote on, but you have to be willing to challenge sexism amongst your peers, and in the same way that white people had to be willing to challenge racism with white people, not just to be a friend of the colored people, as I say sarcastically, but to actually um, engage white people on the issue of, of the issue of their racism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Michael, where are you now? Are you in the States or are you, I know you lived in Hungary for a while. Where, where right, are you right. No, as of September of last year, I'm a, a reborn Philadelphian. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> no, I'm back in Philly. <laughs> Oh, great. So are you still working in movement circles or are you, are you, are you working with any particular organization? I, well, we, my, the wife and I work with a, a refugee group in Hungary still, but that's a long story. But in terms of here in the U.S., I haven't been doing much lately, but uh, um, as soon as this book reality will slows down, I'm on the go. I mean, I have some projects that, you know, are waiting and you have a there's a lot of promotion going on with the book still, is that right? Yeah, yeah. And you know, I do want to say, because it's so easy to forget uh in terms of Zahar and myself, but it's it's the book was conceived of by Dan Berger that uh he had to convince us, I know me, to even do it and spend take the time to engage. And I think that he did just a a masterful job at weaving the complexity of our lives into one narrative. And I just just want to underscore my love and respect for Dan and what he was able to accomplish. Yeah, yeah Zara, you met Dan was your first, one of your early students, right? Is that the case in Florida? Uh, yes, and, and, and uh, let me just say that when Dan mentioned uh, on, seven years ago now that he wanted to write a, a book about Mike and me and, and Aisha at that point, he wanted to weave the three of our lives together. And I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Nobody's gonna be interested in us, nobody's. I mean, I couldn't even imagine uh, it. And I couldn't imagine, I, and I said to him, you're never gonna get a publisher. Why would they publish it? So I'm happy to have been proven wrong uh, but uh, yes, um, I met uh, uh, Dan in 2000. It was his freshman year and my freshman year as a professor here at UF. And, uh, you know, he, he reminded me because I thought it was in a class I was teaching. That came later. He first met me when I was invited to a history class that he was taking to uh, give a lecture on the civil rights movement. And he talks about how listening to me talking about uh, Mississippi, the Atlanta project, he said he was, uh, and he was already, you know, a, an activist in high school uh, that he said, oh my God, it's a lot of stuff I don't know about the movement. So he did then take a class with me, which was the second semester that I was here at UF. And, uh, you know, we've been friends ever since uh, that time. You not only got a, not only got a publisher, you got a major commercial publisher, basic, basic books. It's everywhere. Never, you can find it everywhere. I think we're going to, Ariel says we're going to try to be holding it, getting it on our store as well, but you can find it, find it, I'm sure any major bookseller and, and please support yes. it. It's really yes. good really great book it's and and look we've we're going to end with a prayer in a, mo a moment here from you zahara but i want to say a couple things we have not even scratched the surface of so many questions and things people are asking uh so we will hope to do a follow-up to this so stay tuned we will do something soon hopefully uh we'll we'll, we'll re reconnect after this and, and get back to you all on that thank you for all for your questions and your passion it's so evident here that this is something that people really love to talk about issues of gender issues of faith issues of the movement and continuing, et cetera, generationally. Uh, and and I uh, want, after Zahara- quick, sorry, Yes, just a quick question to about the book and, and getting it, it, it is everywhere, including Amazon. So I wonder of you, Zahara and Michael, if you have a preference, um, an independent bookseller or such that uh, oh, absolutely. you would recommend would... for people to buy it through. Oh, they don't have a particular um, venue but not Amazon. I mean, All right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm clear on that. I mean, uh, uh, independent in bookstores. And Indi uh, support independent bookstores, wherever you are. Yes. Actually, go to your local bookstore. If they yeah. have are not already getting it, ask them to get it. And that would probably be the best way. And let me ask people to get it in your public libraries. Yeah. So go to your librarian and have your librarians to order it so that it's in the bookstore, I mean, in the library, so that people who maybe can't afford, because it's a hardback at this point, uh, they would be able to borrow it. 
And lastly, please save the chat. And uh, if you send me the chat, I will be happy to try and sketch out some answers to questions and we can decide how you might want to share those answers since we had such good questions that could not be spoken to. I can attest to the fact that, that Zahara doesn't sleep because I get emails from her at three in the morning or text. Did you see this, Bill? And I was like, do you ever sleep, lady? Come on. Uh, so anyway, uh, which we love her for. So she will get to this So because her energy is extraordinary, seriously. Um, and Anthony, uh, Ethan mentions Anthony Grimes' review for of the book will be coming out on Waging Nonviolence. And we'll promote that on our, our on the Waging Nonviolence page as well as Fellowship Magazine. Uh, and I also want to say this is something after the after we're done, after after Zahar's, we, we do the, the prayer, we had so many people stick around. It's extraordinary number of people stick. If people want to stay around and say hello, I'm going to stay on and, and Zahara can say hello quickly or say just, so we're going to keep the microphones open, try not to deluge her with your thanks and love. But we'll stay on here as long as it takes if people want to kind of gather and do a little fellowship over Zoom at the end of this. And and with that, uh, if if Ariel or turn on your cameras, sorry, Bill, what'd you say to me? I was going to say I'm going to have Zahara give a little prayer to finish it up. Yep. And other than and that, ask if, to turn on their cameras and unspotlight us so that we can all be on screen together. Thank you. And and uh, you know we know that some of our colleagues from AFSC, from SNCC, from the Unitarians and all of here. So we just give you greetings and thank you so much for coming uh, to this uh, event. And thank you FOR for hosting it. Thank you. You're welcome, please. And, and if you'd like to lead us out with a prayer, uh, that'll be wonderful. Okay, and, and as, um, a Muslim, I will start out with uh, what all Muslims start out with uh, a saying, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, which means in the name of God, the most merciful and the most beneficent. Uh, dearest mother, father, God, creator of all the universes and all within it, in this time of war, poverty, hunger, and disease, not created by you, but by those among us who have taken way more than their share of what has been provided and have abrogated to themselves dominion over our earth. Remind them and us that only love, peace, compassion, justice, and wisdom are enduring are these, as these are your divine qualities. May we unite to build the beloved community. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, everybody, for being Amen. with us.